You cannot, if these computers and these engineers can't figure out how to outsmart the system, you cannot outsmart the system. I'm telling you right now. Hey everybody, my name is AJ and this is The Wealthy Idiot Show. Before we get any further, please head down and just tap that like button real quick. Helps us out tremendously, helps people see our videos so that they can learn all this great financial information as well. So we super appreciate it. And everyone who has liked us or subscribed to us to this point, thank you so much for all the support. I cannot express to you how amazing it has been to do this experience and just see everybody's interactions in the comments, it's outstanding. So today, I found a video from Dave Ramsey. I know that's a surprise, but I found one. It's called, I borrowed $20,000 on credit cards to invest, now I'm broke. Oh, caller guy. Oh, this hurts my soul a little bit. I don't disagree with Dave Ramsey for pretty much all of this, but I think this is an interesting topic because I've actually thought about this recently and I sat down and figured out the numbers for what this might look like. And what I mean by this is buying investments with debt. So I feel like we gotta at least listen to some of this and respond to it so I can explain to you what it is you're looking for when you're talking about investing on debt, what is and isn't a good idea, and help you understand why just buying investments on credit cards is not the way to go. So let's get into it. Today's question comes from Rick in Delaware. He says, I'm 27 years old and for the most part, I follow your financial advice. I only pay for things with cash or debit. However, I have over $100,000 of open credit. When stocks crashed earlier this year, I used two of my credit cards to borrow $20,000 at 0% interest and bought S&P index ETFs. I thought, wow, stocks crashed, I'll buy now, pocket three to 5,000 when the market bounces back and pay off the balance. Now the ETF values are even lower. The total I had in the stock market was 30,000 and now I only have 21,000. The 0% APR on the cards will end in October of next year. Should I pay off my credit cards now and take a loss of $9,000 or should I ride the wave until the loan is over since all the money is in indexes? I have only $2,000 in cash, I make $35,000 a year, and I have about $1,500 in monthly expenses. What's the one major thing that's missing in that entire statement? I thought it was really interesting. I caught it right away. What is the interest rate you're paying on these cards after the 0%, right? Because that changes a lot. If the interest rate on these cards is like 19% and it's going to flip from 0 to 19%, are you telling me you're going to ride out these ETFs for like 19% annual interest for how long? Like we don't know how long it's going to take for these ETFs to bounce back. So just right off the bat, he didn't say how much the interest rate was going to turn into. And you would have to know that if you were trying to decide whether or not to like ride this out and see what happens. A lot of bad decisions were made here. <laughs> That's why you get the big bucks, George. <laughs> this, Rick sounds like a 27-year-old making $35,000 who thought he was going to get rich quick. Proverbs says, um, he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Every time you set yourself up to get rich quick, you're going to get your head taken off. It could be down further, and you could be further in the hole. Or it could come up, and you might not, not have to write a check for $9,000. $9,000 is a lot of money when you make 35000 Yeah, $9,000 is a lot of money. Make it like... Basically, he took out $30,000 worth of debt. Is that what he said? Un against $35,000 income. He basically gambled his yearly income. Ugh, that's not good. But um, I've said on this channel before too, and this is purely speculation. So chef speculation segment. I don't think we've actually hit the recession yet. I think that we've hit a portion of the recession. Like we've hit because of the interest rate increases, we hit a little bit of weirdness. And I think that um, we saw a GDP dip because of issues with supply chains and stuff, but I don't think we've actually hit the recession yet. So it's possible that October of next year could be the bottom of the bottom and he could be down another $10,000 or more. I mean, it could be bad because, oh man, he guessed at where the bottom was and he got it wrong and he's lost a lot of money. So when I've done something stupid, Rick, and I have done a lot of stupid things, I have a PhD in DUMB, buddy. So uh, when I do something stupid and it causes me to lose money, I call that stupid tax. 
and you young man are getting ready to write a check for stupid tax. The only question is how big the check is. You can name your poison right now. It's 9000 bucks, and call it. Call it a day. I learned my lesson, not playing this game anymore. And you'll be done with this forever. What are we doing giving 27-year-olds making thirty-five dollars $100,000 of open credit? Uh, we didn't, but uh, some idiot bank did. Uh, so, but yeah, so Rick, you really have two options. I mean, one is limit your losses to 9000 or take a chance. I have a third solution. And um, I'll tell you what it is now, and I'll explain it a little bit more later. Just leave the ETFs there. Don't touch them. And then pay off the entire amount of debt. I think it was originally $30,000. Just like work Uber, deliver pizzas. Uber Eats is, a, what's the other one? DoorDash. Like, I mean, pick some other thing and just work your butt off trying to pay off the amount of debt. I think in the long run, you'll end up having made money because those ETFs will eventually come back. So you might as well keep them and then just pay the debt off separately. So I, I think what he's suggesting here is pay, you know, sell the ETFs and then work on that 9,000. But I think you should work on the 30,000. And then when it's all said and done, you're going to have a net worth. Uh, that's not terrible. What is the market going to do between now and October? I do not know. His track record of timing I, I, the market I think, is I think the great. market is going to come back up, but I don't know if it's going to make it by October. I think nope. there's enough negative pushes on the market that I don't know if it recovers 100% of your money by October. I Oh, I just realized it says 20000 at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> I've been saying 30000 this whole time. Uh, so if I'm in your shoes and I don't know, what I don't need is more pain. I'm probably going to – I would rather have a known devil than a future unknown devil. Mm. Because that nine thousand could turn into twelve thousand by October. It could. It could turn into fifteen. Uh, before it turns into nothing. I mean, it could turn into nothing. That's a pos Everything's a possibility here on the table. But so I, I think you're paying nine thousand dollars in tuition to the school of life, and you're getting ready to write a check and graduate with honors. And so, so yeah, what is the mentality behind this? Is it this? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna outsmart the system. I figured it out. Yeah, there's an. Let me Is tell that you, arrogance. Every time you fall for get rich quick, it's um, usually not every time. It, it's almost always got an, a level of arrogance to it. Like I, you know, I understand that there's risk, but I am smarter than all these people who perceive there to be too much risk because I've got this figured out. So in this thread. Our phones are now capable of taking pictures. Like if you just take a regular iPhone, Google, um, Android phone, whatever, and you just take f photos of like plants and dogs and cat, it'll actually tell you the species of a dog. It'll tell you the species of a plant when you take photos of it. That's how smart these devices are now. And then we have people like, you know, Tesla or Elon Musk and Tesla working on self-driving cars. And he started doing it. And then everybody is now working on self-driving cars. If you live in the Bay Area, you see some new company with like some vehicle with decals, you know, splashed all over it for their brand. And then cameras all around these cars to try and figure out how to get these cars to drive on their own. Uh, that's called machine learning. And what you're doing is you're teaching a computer how to recognize patterns. There have been a lot of people who have been trying to push patterns into a machine learning frameworks to try and predict what the markets are going to do so that they can take advantage of that since machine learning came out and they have yet to figure out a pattern that makes sense. And the reason is there are trillions of variables in the market and people don't act rationally. If people act rationally, maybe we could figure this stuff out, but people don't act rationally. They act emotionally. And when people act emotionally, you can't predict what it is that they're going to do. You cannot, if these computers and these engineers can't figure out how to outsmart the system, you cannot outsmart the system. I'm telling you right now. Bless your heart, Rick. I'm sorry, man. Sucks. I'm sorry you're going through this. But hey, good news is only $9,000. Good news, you're 27. You got the rest of your life to never do this stupid butt stuff again. That's the end of the video. Rick, man, I am sorry. You learned a tough lesson. You know, Dave and George told you just basically the whole truth there. They gave you a couple of options. I think that there's a third. You could hustle, find a way to make more income over the next six, you know, until October, whatever that 
you know, is one year from now, is that, is that when it happens? Um, or was this video older? So this video was a little bit older. So it's, it's now October. Yeah, hopefully Rick has figured it out. But if it was me, I would hustle to figure out how to pay this debt off. I wouldn't touch those ETFs because at some point when they bounce back and they grow, they'll grow past what your debt is and what the interest you paid on that debt is going to be at some point. So I think that the third option of just leave the ETFs there, go work your butt off to pay this debt down as fast as possible. I think that's the route to go. So it's a hybrid of I guess what I'd recommend to people and what Dave recommends to people pay off the debt, but also don't sell the ETFs. All right. There are several main points around this that I want to explain because I think it's important to understand what it is that we're doing when it comes to debt and using debt to invest. Because I talk about real estate. We talk about using debt to invest. The first is the, um, the banks giving you debt are giving you an interest rate based off of the risk of the thing. So if you go buy a house, there's risk involved, but there's a whole house backing that risk. That's why real estate loans are some of the lowest interest rates that you can have. If you go get a security backed loan, so a loan against your investments, like if you go to your brokerage and you're like, look, I own all these stocks, want to get a loan against that. It's going to be the a low interest rate because they can take those stocks if you can't pay back that loan. Same for like a HELOC for a house. Um, Anything backed is going to have low interest rates. Things that are not backed will have high interest rates. Credit cards are one of those things. Credit cards are, they give you the, the rate based off of the risk at the moment that you applied. And then they hope that that works out. It's always going to be a high rate. So like if I could get 4% on a home loan, I'm going to get 10% on a credit card. If someone could get 8% on a home loan because their credit's not good, their credit card is going to be like a 20% rate. So the fact that they that Rick didn't say what the rate is kind of leads me to believe it's probably not good. The introductory rate was solid, but the long-term rate is not terribly good. I think that that's probably why I didn't say it. So moral of that point is don't take out credit card debt for investments. Worst type of loans that you could possibly get. The second thing I want to point out is that any type of investing that you do with debt, it starts to round the risk off the longer you can possibly have that debt. So if you take a snapshot of the U.S. economy, so we talk about the S&P 500, over the course of its entire existence, it has an average yearly return rate of 10%. Over the course of the existence of the S&P 500. Now take a 30-year times, like a snippet, and move that snippet around. At any point on that graph, it's going to roughly be a 10%-ish return. It's going to go up at some places, down in some places. Now take a 15-year snippet, 10, 5, 1, right? We have a one-year snippet of the S&P 500 and it's down right now. If you were to say the average over the last year, it's going to be a negative number, right? So the longer you have something, the more chance it has to grow and the more the probabilities work in your favor. The shorter you have it, the less the probability works in your favor. So if you're going to take out debt that you're only planning on holding for a little bit, three months, six months, whatever that 0% introductory rate was, and you're gonna YOLO it at some stuff to see what sticks and what happens, that short term makes what you're doing a total gamble. So we talk about the, the safe and the risky sort of spectrum where Dave wants you to be here, I want you to be here, Rick is like way over here. He's like, I'm YOLOing credit card debt at this and we're hopefully the economy will come back. And I don't know what research he did to say the, that the economy was gonna come back because it wasn't this channel. We weren't saying it was coming back. We don't think the recession has actually come yet. So I don't know what Rick's watching, but uh, Rick, subscribe to the Wealthy Idiot Show because you obviously need to see what we're saying here. The third thing that we got to cover when it comes to taking out debt for investing is you never want to pay the in, the payments on the debt, the interest or the principal with the, the appreciation of the asset. So this, this is a little bit fuzzy because real estate... You know, obviously we're paying the loan off with the real estate. We're paying the mortgage with our rental properties, but we're paying the mortgage with the cash flow on the rental properties, not the appreciation of that rental property. So I'm not going to take out, like I'm not going to um, refinance my property and then use that money from the refinance to go pay off the mortgage, right? The reason is, is when you start doing that is you're eating away at your compounding interest. The, the, you want to maintain that asset and keep it there. So, you know, chuck the real estate thing out, out the window and let's just talk about index funds. If you have index funds that are compounding every year, 
if you're shaving off a portion of that to pay the interest, that compounding drops dramatically. So if you have like a 10% gain, but you use like 8% of that to pay the loan back, you have a 2% gain. The compounding the next year, even if it's a 10% compound, is going to be so much less. So in order to maximize your returns, you want to pay the loan off with some other source of income and use that debt to buy those ETFs, whatever it is, and leave them there. And you want to accomplish the longest time possible. Something that you could do that would make sense is take a refinance out on one of your rental properties, use that ref that money that you got from the refinance, send it towards a bunch of ETFs, whatever. Your refinance is 30 years. Your people living in the home is repaying your mortgage. So you're not having to pay that out of your own pocket or out of those index funds. Those index funds now compound you know, 10% per year over the next 30 years on average, and you're going to make a bucket ton of money from that. So that would be a method in which it would make sense to do this uh, strategy. So if you followed all the steps to this point, the last thing that you have to ensure is that you have to ensure that your expected gain over the time period you're taking that debt out is going to be higher than the interest that you're paying. Otherwise, it, it equals all out. So if you're going to take a 30-year loan out at a 4% interest rate and you expect to get an average of 10%, then that makes mathematical sense. You're, remember, you're playing probabilities still, but it makes mathematical sense. And the longer that you can get that going, the more chance you have of being successful. If you take out a loan for your credit card at 20% interest rate, and then you YOLO it at something that has a 10% average yearly return, you're negative 10%. You will spend more money. Even if you use a second source of income to pay off that debt, you're going to spend more money paying that debt off you know, not just the principal, but the interest, then you're gaining on your actual investment. It's not worth it. You could have just taken that money that you had to pay the debt off and you could have just put it into the index funds on a regular basis, lower that dollar cost average, and you come out pretty well on top. So I want to wrap up there. If you're thinking about taking out debt, I'm going to do some episodes where I show the numbers and why it makes sense to do all the steps that I just described. And and the reason I thought this was interesting is that I've been considering this as a possibility, taking out some sort of loan, you know, hopefully as long term as I can, 10 plus years and putting it into stuff because of the fact that the market's down. But I'm keeping in mind the length of time. I'm trying to make sure that those those uh, items stay in the market for as long as possible. And I'm making sure the debt is as long as possible that I can, that I can make it. I want it to be an interest rate that makes sense. So nothing 20%, it's gotta be lower than 10%. And I'm gonna be using other methods to pay that debt off to make sure I can maximize that compounding interest over time. So thanks for stopping by. If you have any questions, please comment down below. We'll try to answer them as best we can. And as I'm kind of walking through this process and taking a look at it, I'll let you know how it's going. We'll see if we can figure some stuff out. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.